using Python to spy on your friends, uh, ReconNG and open source intelligence. Uh, ReconNG is one of the tools that I'm going to talk about, but there's lots of ways to do it without those. Awesome, it worked. Uh, my name's Brian King. Uh, BB at times when there are rooms full of Brian's. Uh, I work at Black Hills Information Security and I'm a pen tester. I'm fairly new to Python. This was billed as like an introduction, uh, uh, beginner level class. So uh, who here has been using Python like weekly for more than a year? All right. All those, everybody who didn't raise your hand, those are the people you want to talk to with your Python questions about why did you do it that way? Or was that really right? Maybe there's a better way. There's definitely a better way. I just haven't come across it yet. So this was how I found out that I was living in a little bubble. I was getting feedback from the CFP folks and they said, I don't know what OSINT is. And of course my reaction, my selfish reaction was, well, how can they not know what that is? That's crazy. So I asked my developer friends on Twitter if that was the case, you know, don't, doesn't everybody know what that is? And, um, and they said no, that it, it wasn't familiar to them either. So I'm going to start with what is OSINT. OSINT is open source intelligence. Um, which I'm going to explain in a minute. I want to get back to, to the jargon thing. When I was, um, first came to Python, uh, my, my last scripting language before Python was Perl, and um, don't throw anything at me. Uh, and there's a lot of jargon in the Python community and in other languages. Every language has their own jargon. And this was the one that always jumped out at me, this list comprehension thing. Because it, it comes up all the time when you're talking about writing Python that's beyond, you know, beginner baby steps levels. This is something people use all the time, but the phrase has nothing to do with its component words. Uh, I'm still not quite used to it, but it's a totally valuable phrase to use. It means things to the folks who use it, and it's great. There's nothing wrong with it. But somebody off the street, you say, oh, I'm going to use list comprehension. They're going to say, you're going to try to understand that list? That's great. I'm happy for you. So, so OSINT is my list comprehension. Um, it's open source intelligence, and this is where it gets very jargony. It's not open source like open source software. It's open sources. So when you're talking about gathering information about a person, about uh, a company, about a government, about a military, about whatever. Uh, what you're gathering, they call it intelligence. It's just information. Um, intelligence might be information with some analysis applied. Um, and it comes from sources. It comes from somewhere. It might come from the newspaper. It might come from um, the chief executive's assistant. It might come from the soccer coach of the kid who works for the guy you're investigating. Um, all kinds of different sources. Uh, some of them are open, some of them are not so open. So OSINT, open source intelligence, is just information that's collected from publicly available resources. So like list comprehension, it's, it's very simple. It's just kind of an opaque term. So some intelligence comes from sources that are open, and this is generally things that anybody can come across. So we've got some open sources on the one side and some less open sources on the other side. Uh, and there's actually, this is again where the security community sees things a little bit differently than most regular folks. Uh, the second example over there about sources that are not open, well, sometimes your bank records do become open. There's a data breach, your bank got popped, somebody, somebody uh, found SQL injection in your, your bank's database, which I hope they're beyond that by now. But once that stuff's released, it's released. And now it's open source. So the difference is I don't need to like hire somebody or have somebody well placed with, uh, with special privileges or permissions to get the information. So OSINT is fun because anyone can do it. It's just out there, you're just reading stuff. I like to think that it's just advanced paying attention. The stuff's all right out there. You just have to know where to look and, and take some time to pull things together and make a story out of those little individual bits of information. So this is, uh, I've, I've blacked out things in here just because I don't want to call attention to people who have nothing to do with anything. Um, but here's an example. This is like the, the most common one that we use in pen testing when I'm trying to research a company and I want to find out who might work there, maybe who's your network administrator, who's your chief information officer, what kind of tools do you use, who else works with you. Uh, if you just go to LinkedIn and find anybody, uh, this person is a software competency leader at Delphi. And what LinkedIn does for you over on the right there, it gives you a bunch of other people that work at Delphi. That's awesome. 
So, so now, if I want to talk to this person up here, uh, maybe I'm going to call and pretend I'm Daniel. Hey, um, uh, I'm the, uh, the group leader with the uh, DCS environment, and uh, we had a question about, uh, you tried to log in, and uh, we had got an error message. I think you should try that again. Could you just tell me your password, let me log in as you, and see if I get the same results? So I'm leveraging what's available out there. This, this person whose page I'm looking at might work with Daniel. A little bit more work, I'd be able to find out for sure if they do or not, if that's a good ruse. So that's the easy, simple, obvious example of what OSINT is. Uh, here's another one that's a little bit less obvious, and I will talk about Justin Seitz a little bit uh, later in the presentation. He is, if you're interested in this at all, he's the guy you want to listen to. Uh, he's got a blog called Automating OSINT, and he is a huge Python fan, and he's really good at it, um, which means when I look at his code, it's very concise. It's a lot less wordy than what I would write, and he explains it very well. He walks you right through it. Uh, he gives some information available for free. He's got some classes that he teaches, uh, but the blog's there. So he, he's got uh, just a recent post here about how to figure out people's daily routines by looking at their Facebook timeline. And just in a nutshell, every time you post something on Facebook, um, you're posting, you're typing whatever you're typing. Hey, my cat's sleeping in a sunbeam. And that's what you think you post. And you do post that, but you post other stuff too. You post always the date and time when you made that post. Sometimes you post your location if your settings are set that way. Uh, there may be other information that goes along with that that's visible either to the folks at Facebook or other people who can see your timeline on Facebook. So if you just go through the history of people's posts and pull out the timestamps, you can start to see when they're on Facebook. And you'll see, you'll see peaks and troughs, and you'll see sometimes there's a dip. You know, this person always goes about 10.30, never, never online between 10.30 and 6. Um, maybe you'll find somebody who's posting all day from work. Um, maybe that's part of your job. Maybe, maybe you need to research some employee malfeasance and you need to figure out what they're doing. Were they, were they actually online at this time? And here's, you can do it. It's, it's right there in front of your nose if you know where to look. So there's some fun you can have with OSINT. There's a guy on Twitter who runs this, this, um, this Twitter feed called Need a Debit Card. And I'm not sure that it's totally automated, but he just finds pictures uh, people where people post pictures of their debit cards, credit cards, whatever. And I've, I've obscured the number there. It wasn't like that. If you go look for this, it's, it's just there. And people do this a lot. It's shocking how much people, they're like proud of their debit card. Hey, I got a debit card and look at this cool picture I put on it. And they share it with the world. Maybe they don't realize that their Twitter feed is open. Maybe Facebook changed their privacy settings on, again, on you again and you didn't notice that that thing you thought was private isn't anymore. So, so, this, so how likely do you think this is to be true? Is this like a real thing? Is that, it looks, it looks pretty well, I, I buy it at first, but sometimes people play around with it too. So here's another one, um, got lucky with my due debit card, got 777 on the front and on the back. Well, of course it's on the back because it's the same number. But can you read the signature? It says already, can so it's already canceled, hashtag troll. <laughs> so people will mess with you. Uh, people who know this is going on, they play the game too. So why am I talking about OSINT at a Python conference? Well, I told you before, I'm a little bit new to Python. I'm not like awesome at it. You don't want to copy my code. Um, and I don't learn things well from like a book. I've, I've done the book route and I always get to like chapter three and a half and I just lose interest. I, I don't want to write another thing to keep track of my CD collection because I don't have a CD collection anymore. I need like real problems to solve, things that are actually useful for me and interesting for me. And so I always just space out halfway through the book. So this is how I'm learning Python right now. And maybe there's something in here that you can use too uh, to learn some Python yourself and to learn some OSINT, which would be awesome. So here's an example. I'm going to show you uh, very simple, just a couple of things you can do to get some information about somebody. And to do this, I th we're going to start with an email address. A lot of times the work I do, we start with an email address. A lot of times we start with a company and we expand from there. So I'm very rarely interested in just one person. I want to know more about the company. Who works there? What kind, of, uh, what kind of computers do they have exposed to the internet? What services are running on those? And Recon Engine helps me a lot with that. But that's kind of OSINT, that's kind of probably not what you guys are interested in. So pick an email address. So to find an email address, I googled for Python programming luminary. And this is what I found. I found Steve Holden. Is he really a luminary? Do you guys know who he is? 
Well, O'Reilly does. He's got a page up on the O'Reilly community, and his email address is right there. So I don't think that he's going to complain if we use him as an example, because he's already published it right out there for you to find. So Mr. Holden is our guinea pig for looking at some of this stuff. There are services all over the place if you just look for them. The, the internet is still way bigger than Amazon and Google. Um, there's one, mailtester.com. It tests email addresses. So how many of you have gotten an email address or had an application and had a program where your job was to validate email addresses and make sure that they're good? Me too. How tedious is that? So your first thing, oh, regular expressions. There's got to be an at in the middle. There's got to be at least one dot on this side. And there can't be, you know, you've got to have you know, letters and numbers on this side. This goes one step further. This looks up, gives you the email. You give it the email address. It looks up the mail server for that domain. And it asks the mail server, hey, does this account exist? So it's not just format. It's is this really an account or not? And in this case, it is. Steve's not lying to us. If it was not valid, so not Steve, is not valid, and it tells you that. But not all servers will tell you. Some of them just don't play along because they know we're doing something like this. If you want to find out if it's a valid email address, send an email. If it doesn't bounce, it was probably good. So here's where we start getting into what's going on and what can you do with this. So there's a service out there, you can type in an email address, find out if it's valid, big deal. How does it work? This is where you can start learning some things and building some of your own tools. Um, this is just the developer tools in the browser. Who knows F12? F12 in your browser shows you lots of stuff. If you haven't hit F12 in your browser yet, when you go home next time you're online, hit F12 and see what pops up and just start clicking on tabs. It shows you so much information. So this is showing me at the right there, the request URL. So it's slash testmail.php. And then the bottom piece there is another view, and it's showing me what the parameters are that are getting sent in. There's two parameters. There's the language, and there's the guy's email address. That's really easy, right? So have you ever sent an HTTP request with Python? I've done that. So I've read enough to know that everyone loves requests. That's an awesome module for sending and, and receiving HTTP stuff. So this is what I send. I post to the URL that I found in there, and I give it the parameters that I found in there that my browser is doing, and I send it, and I check the status code. It was 200. Awesome. I got it. And look at the response. It's just so much HTML, I'm going to cry. So what are you going to do with that? Somewhere buried in there is, is the email address is valid or email address is not valid. So this is where it starts to get a little fuzzy. How do you find what's in there? This gets back to like parsing email addresses. Is this really something you want to spend your time doing? So you can look uh, regular expression search. Uh, yeah, it's in there, but it might be in there more than once. It might be in JavaScript comments. It might always be there. You don't know. Um, we could try to parse the document manually, which is what we used to do 15 years ago before we had cool libraries to use. Uh, you could find a module to help with the parsing, and I know that there are some out there that will do this for you, but if you're just getting started here, how do you pick? How do you know which one is good? There's more than one, so how do you pick one? What I like to do is I like to cheat, because I'm in security and that's what we do. I like to read what other people wrote. I like to steal other people's tools and try to make them work for me and understand how they work. So reading what's already out there, that's how I learn. I, I, don't, I can't get very far of the book. I like to read what other people have done. So Recon NG comes into play here now. This is, this is the, um, the, the tool set that kind of ties all this stuff together. Uh, it doesn't have its own services. It uses these other services like MailTester, and it creates a database for you that keeps track of all this information that you've pulled down. It's hosted on Bitbucket. I don't know why it's not on GitHub. Everything's supposed to be on GitHub, but it's on Bitbucket. Um, it's open source and free. There's not even a paid version. Um, it's actively maintained. The guy who originally wrote it still maintains it. Tim Tomes is a fantastic guy. Um, he welcomes uh, pull requests. If you've got fixes to make, if you've got a new feature you want to add, a new service you want to incorporate, he is really supportive of those things. He's got a super clear development guide. These modules are, there's the jargon again. It's not a Python module. Um, but the modules, he's got a template that you just, you just fill in the blanks. And that helps you know how to write this thing to interact with this tool. And it helps him because now you're matching his style pretty well. And he's more confident that your submission is going to be something he can maintain over the long run. 
Uh, the one warning, he's got a really strong bias against dependencies. Uh, he wants to keep Recon NG to be simple to install. So if you're calling in other modules, other like parsing modules, other things, um, you need a really good reason for that. And he's probably going to say, no, I don't want that. So just look through the existing modules and see what, um, what modules are included in those things and try to stick with those. And you'll be more likely to have your work accepted if that's what you want to do. If you want to just play with it, knock yourself out. So Recon NG is it's essentially just a database. Um, on the right there, left, right, the categories are the tables. Um, they're all empty right now. And over here are the different modules. And you can see there's a mail tester module. How convenient for my talk, right? So here's a little bit about what's in those tables. Um, for my work, I focus more on the credentials table, which is awesome. Um, companies and contacts. The difference between contacts and profiles is contacts is a person, and profile is that person plus where you can find them online, so their LinkedIn page. The hardest thing for me about getting used to Recon NG in the beginning was where do I go? It's all command line driven, so there's no like menu to pull down to ask for help, but you can always type the word help if you're not a big command line person. Help is always something that's useful. Um, but the way that they're named is, is, is the key. It populates tables based on other tables. And this section in the middle here, here, this, uh, this is the one that we're going to look at. Uh, the section in the middle, contacts-contacts, means that it reads from the contacts table and it updates the contacts table. Um, the one above it, companies-contacts, it reads from the companies table and it updates the contacts table. So if you have a company and that's all you're starting with, you can search for, you can type search, S-E-A-R-S-H, space, companies-dash, and it will tell you all the modules that read from the companies table and do something. Um, if you're not sure where to start but you know where you want to go, you can, do the, you can do the other. You can say search dash contacts, and that will show you everything that writes to the contacts table. See? So we're going to look at the mail tester module, uh, a, a way to see how this stuff works so that we can maybe build some of our own tools or at least get more familiar with what's going on here. Um, can you read that? The, the screenshot, on the, it's a pretty short, okay, awesome. I was afraid. Um, so the first thing I do in Recon NG is I type search for something because I can never remember what I'm supposed to type. So search for mail gives me any module that has the word mail in it and conveniently for this, there's only one. So the next thing I do is I'm going to use that module. Um, if it was not a unique name, I'd have to type in more of it. I'd have to type in maybe use recon slash contact contacts. Um, and then show options. The options are the things that you can control about how this thing works. Uh, and then about halfway down there's show info, which includes options, but is a lot more information. So once you're familiar with it and comfortable with it, you're going to use show um, options more often than show info. But uh, so the options thing is repeated there near the bottom. And the interesting part about this is what is it doing? So there's an option called remove. And it says that it removes invalid email addresses. So if you have a contacts database table full of email addresses and you want it to clean them up for you, set that to true. And it'll just wipe out the ones that don't validate. Um, and then source, this is where you can use Recon NG for other stuff. If you have your own tools, your other things that you want to feed into this. Your source, if you look at the bottom there, your source can be the default, which is a query from the contacts table. Or it can be a string, you can just type in the email address. Or it can be a path to a file that has a list of email addresses, if you got that in some other way. Or you can write your own query against the tables in the database. So maybe you only want to look for email addresses at this particular company. So you could select from where email address like, whatever, and just pull out the things that you want. So we're going to add Mr. Holden to our contact table, because this is the easiest way to keep track. I don't want to just find out if it's valid and move on. I want to start collecting stuff about him. So I say I want to add contacts, um, add the name of the table, and then it prompts you to fill in all those details. And that's just the stuff that I pulled off of that O'Reilly page. Uh, and then show contacts, show table name, just dumps the table out to the screen to show you what you've got. So now you can see we've got him here. Uh, I don't know what his middle name is, so we're going to leave that blank. Uh, but the email address is the one that I found online, but it hasn't been validated yet. But then we just run it, because it's set to select from that table and there's nothing else to configure. So run, R-U-N. And it checks it, and it tells me the address is valid. That was easy. 
But what's it doing? Remember we looked at this in the browser to see what was being sent and, and, and came back and we saw that big huge mess of HTML at the end and that's why we came over here. So how is this handling that big huge mess of HTML? What can I learn about how this tool pulls out that intelligence, that useful information from this sea of tags? So you can turn on debugging output, which I won't show you how to do, but it's really easy, um, and just run it again. And it gives you more information like debug always does. So uh, I added the coloring just so you could see what we're looking at. So it's sending a post to that same place. So it's using the exact same service we found. It's not using some private API or some other method that we weren't already aware of. And it sends uh, to mailtester.com. And here's the, the next blue thing is the, the parameters that get sent. Language is English and email equals Steve at HoldenWeb. Percent 40 is the URL encoded at sign. And then it gets the response. <laughs> it doesn't tell you anything about the response, um, but it tells you that it's valid. So it's kind of glossing over what it did with the response. It's just saying that it made some conclusion from that response. So we're going to use this to learn from because this works. And look how short that is. It's 35 lines. The whole thing is 35 lines and the first 15 is comments. This, this is what I want my Python to look like. I want it to be concise, I want it to be clear, I want it to be pretty much self-documenting. I mean, if you read through that, which I won't make you do it right now, but it's very, it's very easy, it just makes sense. That's one of the cool things about Python is that if it's well written, it, it, it's, almost, it's almost like talking. It's very clear what's going on. So because this is so short, I'm going to start with the imports and see what else I might need to know before I can start making sense of what's in there. So there's two imports. The, the one is from ReconNG, so I'm going to ignore that. I'm assuming that's doing something about the framework, which I don't care about for this. Um, the other one is lxml.html, and it uses the from string function in there. So how can I learn more about that? I can Google for lxml python minus Monty. So uh, this was the first response, and it shows me exactly what that from string does. So uh, for our purposes right now, there's an example at the bottom. It reads some string, and it makes some data structure out of it. I'm, I'm not going to care right now what that data structure looks like, but it's made it something that it can, uh, it can use, it can work with. So after it's made that, uh, what happens next? The next thing is on line 29, we've got tree.xpath. Who knows xpath? Oh, very good. So like two-thirds of you already know XPath. For the rest of you, you're going to learn XPath right now. Look at line 29 and remember what you know about HTML. What is it doing? It's making a message list. It's reading from the table, the last table, and it wants the last table row and the last table data and the text from inside that. Now you know XPath. So I want to follow this through. I want to look at the response and I want to see what it's doing. I want to make sure I understand what the XPath is doing. So I'm back to this thing. I'm a security person. I love the command line. I like doing things with text. So I, I saved a copy of that HTML. I just went back to the web page. I did the request and I saved that as HTML. And now I'm using some command line tools to look through there. Um, the reason I'm doing this here, it turned out not to be necessary, but this is a, a more extensible way of doing this. This one turns out to be really simple, but in a more complicated uh, type of response, if, it's more, if there's more junk in it, um, this may be useful. So I'm going to grep for the opening table tag, and dash n says to give me line numbers, because that's what I really want to know, and dash c2 says give me two lines of context. So the first two lines before, and then the matching line, and two lines after, so I have some idea what I'm looking at. If you just get the one line out, sometimes it's hard to make any sense of it. So with all of this, I learned that the last table, there's only two, I told you it's kind of easy, the last table begins on line 115. So I'm only interested in things after that, because they're going to be in that table. So now I'm going to look for the table rows. Same thing. The last table row is at 149, so I want to look after line 149. And then TD, same thing. This is uh, the last one there is on line 153. That's after 149, so I'm in the right ballpark. And that's what it found. That's what I read on the web page too, didn't you? That was the important part. So that seems reasonable, so I, now I know what it's doing. I've, I've got a Python program that I didn't write that does what I want it to do in 35 lines, and I've gone through it, and I understand what every line is doing. 
So I'm going to try to recreate this myself. I want to see if there's something else going on here. Maybe there's something else in that response that's, um, that could affect how this parses out. I want to see what, um, there's actually a line in there that I, I'm still not really clear on why it's that way. And this is, uh, so I want to try it a different way to see if I got a different result. And I'll show you how that goes. So I'm going to be reading from a local file instead of requesting from the server every single time um, for two reasons. One, there might be some sort of limiting on the server. Maybe I might annoy the people who run the service. And the other is if I'm getting live data all the time, what do you know about live data? It's never the same. So I don't, want to, I don't want any of that stuff to mess me up. So I'm going to read from a static file that I've pulled out of here. Uh, so I'm minimizing my variables. I don't care all that much about annoying the website because I'm only going to do it you know, 20, 30 times. But the, the consistency is really what I'm more interested in. So back to that, um, the, the document I found at the beginning about um, parsing the... Uh, parsing the XML, there's another method in there called parse, which will accept a file name or a URL or a file. So, well, why didn't it use this? It used from string, right? It didn't use parse, but it looks like it could have used either one. I wonder why it didn't. Um, but this one takes a file name. That's what I want. So, I fire up Python on my command line, and I'm just doing that one little part in the middle that reads the response and parses out the piece I'm interested in. I'm not going to worry about requesting the file. I'm not going to worry about the framework stuff. I'm just narrowing in on the part that I'm interested in. So I import parse, not from string. And then the rest is just uh, copied and pasted, literally, from the, uh, from the module. And uh, what I'm doing, I'm doing this you know, advanced debugging. I'm just writing out variable names as they become defined. So the message list is a list of messages, and there's only one message in there. Uh, and then this last part, this was the part that I was confused about. Why, why are we doing this join x dot strip for x in message list? That's the list comprehension, isn't it? I think. Um, so what it's doing is it's just pulling out the first bit of that, of that list. Why, why is it going to all that trouble? Can't it just read like the first element? So this is my first sign that maybe there's something else about that response that I'm not aware of. Maybe in other cases the response is different and we have to do some manipulation to get what we want. And then below this, the second half, is this is when I searched for not Steve so I could get a failure and see if I got what I would expect. And you would expect to pull out the string that says it didn't match and that's what we got. So my understanding is pretty good of this so far. There is... Um, the, the one more thing that, that we didn't test that the module isn't mentioned is, is not allowed. So that was the case where uh, the web server at Yahoo at the beginning won't do this for you. So this module doesn't explicitly test for that response. Well, shouldn't it? Isn't that something else we should worry about? Um, well, no, because it looks at the message and it says if does not exist appears in the message, which doesn't appear in the message if it's not allowed, it's different. So there is a whole condition here that can happen, but it's totally safe to ignore. So this is my question about is there a simpler way? Can I just pull out that, um, that first element of the array and get the same result? And, and this, is, this, is, this is yes. So, uh, so I pulled out the first thing and I stuck that in uh, you know, message list zero, it's already there, and then rebuilt it as the message and those two things are exactly equivalent. So there's something else here that I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't know why he chose to do it that way, but they both work. So this is something that I would maybe follow up on, uh, if depending on how much time I have and where you know where the interests go, and if I'm starting to glaze over yet, um, maybe this is worth going into. Maybe um, I don't know. Maybe you could request more than one email address at a time from the from the system. Maybe sometimes uh, there's more content that has to parse through. I don't know. So I talked before about contributing to this, which is also a good way, this or any project really, is a great way to get some feedback on your coding style and whether you're, um, you're writing good stuff that, is, that makes sense and that fits, is easy for someone else to understand and that they'll agree to own and maintain for forever. Um, and Tim is great about this. Uh, if you go to the, the place where his repo is, uh, the whole history of all the pull requests is in there. And he's just, I mean, he's, he's pretty quick um, and he's pretty, uh, 
he's, he's got a very clear vision of where he wants this framework to go and what he expects and what he will accept and what he won't. Uh, so he'll, he'll respond to you quickly and if you've, if you've pulled in some module that he decided he doesn't want to have a dependency, he will tell you. He's nice about it, but he'll say, you know, rewrite this without the module. So pretty concise feedback, but, but it's good. So that was with the um, uh, parsing out HTML. Uh, not everything is buried in HTML. There's all these APIs now that give you back machine readable stuff in JSON or XML or whatever you might enjoy. So we're going to use that for the next step. I want to find out where else he is. So I just went to a whole lot of trouble to verify that the address he published is actually an email address. So I didn't learn a whole lot about him, but I learned a lot about the, the, um, the, the tool and about how those things are actually working in there. So there's another service out there called Full Contact. And what Full Contact does, among other things, is it, um, you can feed it an email address and it will tell you where on the internet that email address is associated with user accounts. Uh, it does more than that. They, they search for other things as well. Um, you can look for companies. Uh, the card reader API, you can send them an image of a business card. <laughs> and they will parse out the text and save you the trouble of typing the text. Um, but this, this is all it is. It's, uh, there's an API key, the, the, um, like the base level is free, and it's totally enough for what you guys are going to be doing initially. And all you do is you get the URL and you send the email, and it sends you back an answer. So you can get your JSON, you get your XML, you get HTML, whatever you want. And this is what this looks like when we run it. So this is... Um, there wasn't any setup to do. This was the same thing. I've got, um, I've got Mr. Holden in my contacts table, and this module by default reads from the contacts table, so I just have to type run. That's it. I did have to put my, my API key in, um, but, but that was it. So we've got his email address, which we knew. Uh, we've got some different titles that are associated with him. We've got his location. Uh, we've got different places where he appears online. So, so this is uh, Steve Holden, this is just an example, but where else might this type of information be useful? Um, you know, the, I talked about spying on your friends. This could be kind of fun to see what other services are they using. You know, if, if they didn't tell you that they're on this other service, you can go find them there and just start talking to them. That can be kind of funny. Um, but uh, you can go, and if they're not on one of those, you can go register under the username they usually use and then just tease them from there. Um, but what about, what about work? What about people that you work with? What about your company? What about places where you want to work? What about people you've met at the conference that maybe, hey, you know, somebody, you know, the, the guy down there doing the, um, uh, the, the static analysis talk, you know, I want to follow up with him. So I get his email address. Maybe I can do this to him and find out where else he might be. And it sounds kind of creepy, <laughs> and and it, it can be, right? But it's all in what you do with it. So if, if I do that and I find this person and I'm looking to see, maybe we have common interests. Maybe, uh, maybe he lives near me. I'm, I'm always surprised whenever I find a new person on Twitter who lives in Columbus. I, I just somehow, I just don't think people live here. So when they, when they do live here, it's, it's great. Uh, so you can use it, I mean, totally above board. Just, you know, do we have common interests? Do, are you, you know, he's doing the same kind of stuff I'm doing. Maybe there's a, uh, maybe there's a local uh, group. There, maybe there's a meetup or something that he's part of that I didn't know about. So you can use it for those things. There is a, there's a confidence level at the bottom, if you can see that, 87% confidence in that result as a set, and that comes from the full contact API. Like I said, ReconNG um, doesn't do much analysis. It just makes all these things easy to use and builds for you a database of all the results. So, so what does that mean, 87%? Is that better than like 82%? Probably not. Um, but it tells you that there is some uncertainty here. Remember back the, the credit card with the trolling you? Yeah. It might not be exactly him. Just because there is somebody on Flickr with that same username doesn't mean it's him. So you can't go to the bank with this. You should go and check and see. But, um, but it's, it's a great first way to start. Another thing you can do here, and uh, Justin Seitz does this in one of his uh, free lessons, is you see how, the, uh, how GitHub and Twitter and Flickr all use the same sort of pattern for your username. Your username appears in the URL. 
if you go to github.com slash holdenweb, you're going to get one type of response. If you go to github slash com dot com slash not holdenweb, which doesn't exist, you can get a different response. So you could script that up really easily with requests. So give it a username, go to all these different properties, and request the URL that has that username in it. And if I get an HTTP 200 with a lot of content, they're there. If I don't, they're not. Well, there's something you can do. That's, that's a, a nice, quick, easy Python project to play with. Um, and, and it turns out anything you might think of to do with this, somebody else has already done that, uh, which is what makes it so easy to learn from here because Tim's already done this stuff. Uh, but there is um, there's a service out there called Namecheck, which does exactly that. So if you go to namecheck.com and you type in uh, an email address or a username, it goes through, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating, like 100 different places, and it gives you like a color-coded response to see where that username appears and where it doesn't. So I think... I think they sell it as a way to, if you're like trying to establish an online presence for yourself, what's a username that's available in lots of places so I can go register it. But like I said, you know, advanced paying attention, you can use it the other way and see, you know, I found this guy on Twitter, is he in all these other places too? So these are all the tables that we've got. We're well, not all the tables. These are a bunch of tables that we've got in Recon NG, and they all feed off each other. So now with Mr. Holden, we've got, uh, we've got a row in the contacts table for him, and we've got several rows in the profiles table for him. So now I'm going to start looking if I wanted to learn more about him. Now I'm going to look, I'm going to search for profiles dash and see what I can fill based on that information and just keep going. And eventually I'm going to come back and I'm going to, I'm going to start refilling some of these things, rerunning some of these, some of these same modules I've already run because now we've got more data. So it can be kind of a never ending, oh, I want one more type thing. So you have to, you know, make some limits for yourself. But um, it keeps track of it all for you. It uh, keeps it in the database and the coding, uh, I, I like the coding. I think it's a great example to learn from. So if any of this was interesting to you, then go home and play with this stuff. It's so easy to start. There's no reason not to, unless this is like totally boring and you don't care about it. Um, so, so some ideas to do, look, pick on some friends and just mess with them. Uh, look at your current employer, your next employer, where might you want to work next? What can you learn about them? Who might work there? Maybe you know somebody, maybe somebody in common. Maybe, um, maybe the next employer that you're interested in, maybe they're holding a charity event somewhere and maybe you can go to that and just strike up some conversations with folks. Maybe you're more outgoing than I am and that's something you could actually pull off. Um, so you can do it by hand, do it in Python yourself. You can use, use Recon NG just for the feel good of using a Python tool. Uh, you can contribute things back to that and uh, get some really good feedback on how well you fit with that coding style and how efficient your stuff is. So I will leave you with a couple of resources. So Recon NG, obviously, you knew that was coming. And then um, Justin Seitz, who's got the Automating OSINT blog, and he's also got these two um, uh, Python books, which are both great. Um, they're a little bit different focus. The the gray hat Python is more about like um, static analysis. It's more about um, uh, doing things locally on your computer. So it's looking at like Windows binaries and it's finding the entry points for the DLLs and it's doing uh, things that you might do if you're looking to uh, to do some bug finding and exploitation of client side software. So that's like pretty specialized. And then the Black Hat Python is more this kind of stuff that we're talking about, more open source type things, more what can you do with, uh, you know, with the request module and friends, and uh, how can you make use of what you pull back. If you go to, his, go to his blog, do me a favor, go to his blog and just pick one of his more recent things. Look at the, the Facebook When Do You Sleep post and just see how he walks you through step by step how he does each little piece of that. Um, he actually starts with JavaScript um, with that F12. You have like a JavaScript console in your browser. So whatever comes back, you could mess with it. You can replace things, you can pull things out. So that's what he starts with is he just gets a list of all those timestamps by using JavaScript and then he'll paste that list into a Python script and does the analysis in Python. So really wide range it's not just Python, but um, uh, it all is OSINT. Wow. That took me exactly as long as it took me last time. All right. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, I would love to answer some questions. We've got some time. Um, if you want to go, that's cool. I'm done talking. Uh, if you want to have a conversation, I'll be here for a little while. Oh. It doesn't carry the recording very well.
I'll, re I'll repeat it. It might be muted. Um, I, uh, I know you looked at recon and G in your uh, examining its Python code and working on it. Um, I'm also a security professional. Um, and my specialty is in OSINT. So, uh, So the question has to do with Recon NG. So, so, I, so I'm an OSINT professional as well. Um, and you examined um, Recon NG and its Python code. Have you taken a look at the Harvester, which, by the way, is har the harvester.py? He makes a point of the fact that he wrote it in Pi. Right. Um, and for anybody else in the audience who may not be aware, most of us in the security community do tend to write in Python, um, a, a large number of us. Um, and if you've watched the TV show Mr. Robot, um, set, which is being hit pretty heavily in the show, um, Dave Kennedy wrote set entirely in Python. So if you want to take a look at some really efficiently looking Python code, take a look at some of the stuff that um, some of our fellow security professionals have written. It's some pretty well designed code. Th that's true. The, the harvester.py is um, started off as a way to collect and validate email addresses and has grown from there. Uh, set is the social engineer toolkit. Uh, by Dave Kennedy, who's an Ohio guy. He lives up in uh, Cleveland. And that's also free, open source, available. He is like super fast with updates. So, um, yeah. So he's, he, he moves fast. If you want to contribute to that, you better be fast. Um, but that's also a great place to look for example. Yes? Um, it's kind of high level, but have you guys uh, done anything work yet on... Hi, uh, sorry, it's probably kind of high level, but have you guys done any uh, work yet on integrating Recon and G into a full-blown OSINT intelligence cycle? Have we done any work integrating Recon and G into a full-blown OSINT tool? Uh, into, the, into the full cycle. In the full cycle. Well, it's... Um, it collects and, and organizes that data for you. So that's how we use it at, when, I'm, when I'm using it for professional purposes. I'll, I'll do that and I get all that information and then I use those things uh, more manually. So the, the profiles list, I'll go look at those LinkedIn profiles and see if there's something interesting there. Uh, you can script it. It's got, um, uh, it's got a, uh, like a batch interface so you don't have to be typing the whole time. You can script it and incorporate it into other tools as well. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.